Catherine, I'm just so happy to have you here. Oh, no, I'm so happy to be here. This is a pivotal moment in my life being here. Ah, what would you mean? Pivotal moment in your life? Well, you've come into my life, I think, at the right time. So I always knew about your content and how disruptive you are and what a wonderful feminist you are. And then lately, I feel like just in the last year with your wonderful podcast and the clips, I'm thinking, hang on, I, I feel that I have been managing men all wrong in my life. And it hasn't been their fault this entire time. It has been mine. And I'm ready. I feel like I'm ready to dominate my husband. Oh, I did not see that coming. <laughs> well, this is the thing. You've picked the right person to have this conversation no. with because, first of all, I think something that you just said there that's really important is that you're ready. Mm. I feel with my work, a lot of women they have to be in a place where they are ready to receive the kind of things I talk about in order for it to even resonate with them. And I think it's so powerful that a woman like you with the platform you have is prepared to discuss dynamics with men, especially being a powerful woman who is partnered with a man. And a lot of my work touches on, you know, the joys of being single and the ability to empower yourself through how you strategically partner with men. And I think a lot of women whilst many agree and many understand and want to be part of this journey that me and you are both on there are a lot of women who don't get it and I think it comes from a place of fear and apprehension to release what you've always known and in that release realizing that there is something out there for you that could be way better but it's going to involve you changing yourself and a lot of women are not comfortable with changing themselves oftentimes because there is this message that's out there where it's all about, you're perfect, you don't have to change. And <laughs> whilst I agree with that fundamentally, I do think that change does require change. So if you want to see a different outcome for your life, there are going to be elements of yourself that you might need to review and maybe leave behind. And there may be parts of yourself that you might need to give some more nurturing to and spend more time braving that side of yourself up. And women like me and you, we have a very strong, what the spiritual girlies would call a strong throat chakra, meaning that we know how to use our voices and speak for ourselves and hold space. And I deeply admire you. You've been doing what you've been doing for years. You've been making people laugh for years. And me and you do something which I think is quite identical, but through different mediums where we both tell truths that people are not always comfortable to confront, but it's in the way we deliver it and in the way that we articulate it that essentially allows it to digest for people. So we're essentially spiking people by, in your case, you're making jokes and you're and you're dropping things in there that after laughing, people are like, wait, what did I just laugh at? And then mm. they go home and they really think about it. And in my case, I take a more literal approach where I say things that are quite <laughs> oftentimes scathing to hear. But I think a lot of people do recognize that they need to hear it. And I'm curious about how you've arrived at the place you are now. When you speak, I feel very worried. It makes me nervous. I think you are very provocative, obviously. So astute, like so genius. I've seen your work shared by Amanda Seals in America, by loads of people, because I don't think we're used to hearing women speak the way that you speak. And we're so, it's so ingrained in us to uh, anticipate a violent or negative reaction against what you say. So I say things, but I'm lucky that I can almost hide behind a joke. So I say, men are nature's gun. You're most likely to be <laughs> killed by the one in your house, stuff like that. And I, there's kind of a wink there, but it's a dark statement. And then you'll come out and you'll just say, men are lying to you. You need to lie back to them, get money from men, use them for their resources. And I think, whoa, 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 we're not supposed to Tell people that we know. That's the quiet part. Yeah, you, you say the quiet part loud. I love that. And um, I just, yeah, I admire you so much. And I think that, I love what you said about change because I have always been really scared about the incongruity. Even when you're in a bad relationship, for example, and I have been in many bad relationships, exclusively almost bad relationships in my life. Um, I think people stay because it's comfortable, because offsetting that comfortable balance is really scary for a while. You're in a free fall, even if it's better on the other side. And I've been in positions where a good friend would say to me, imagine you would have everything you want in five years. Would you still be doing the things you're doing today? Would you still be with him today? Like, what are you afraid of? 
on the other side of him. And I would think, well, I'm afraid of um, he might all of a sudden get better. I might be with someone even much worse than he is. I just don't know what to – and I would stay in these bad relationships. I was stuck for so long. So so I think what has changed now is just that I'm 40 and I have a wonderful husband and I'm in the right relationship. But as time goes on and we have two small children, which men hate, by the way. They hate the small children or They what? hate <laughs> – I feel like every man, even a great man, and my husband is a wonderful father, but he's a terrible mother. And in this dynamic, mm-hmm. I thought I was supposed to be the father because I work. And I thought he was supposed to be the mother because he wanted to stay at home with the kids. But he will say outrageous things to me like, I need to shower before leaving the house. And I'm like, well, all right, princess. Like, I don't do that when I'm trying to wrangle the children. And I think men feel slightly cheated on when you have kids, they get a little bit jealous of the kids and they miss who you used to be when you prioritize them and put on a pedestal. Having a man's children is really the ultimate betrayal. Being a good mother to those children is the ultimate betrayal. And I think my husband's feeling a little neglected lately. And I think we communicate well. But the more I look at our marriage, I think, well, I want this to last forever. And I work as a top and people recognize me as being very powerful and I say the right things because I know the right things to do. But do I apply those in my marriage? I'm not sure because I think I live as a bottom. I'm very tolerant. I'm like, whatever you want, whatever anybody wants to do. And the other day I decided to make my husband a honey-do list where you go, I need this sorted, I need this done. And that's very much out of my nature. Before I sent it, I felt like a bitch. Before I sent it, I anticipated a negative reaction. I went, oh, you just don't ask for things. But I watched my husband kind of flourish with this honey-do list. And he loved receiving the list. And he loved ticking the things off the list and pleasing me with the list. And then I'm thinking to myself, I, if I want this marriage to be a healthy one. Write a list. <laughs> I think I need to be more powerful, prioritize myself and my needs. And that's what I've learned, I think. That's what's brought me to this point. Reflecting on bad relationships and then being presented with this good relationship But having it be, you know, find its complexity with small children and making space for each other, making time. And I think as a mother, you lose yourself a little bit. You shrink yourself to accommodate everyone else's space. And I feel like if I continue to do that, it's going to affect my marriage badly. I want to learn how to manage men the way you do, specifically manage my husband, but in a way that everyone's Mm -hmm. happy with Mm -hmm. forever. Especially because you're a cancer. (laughs) <laughs> and being oh my gosh. a cancer it's I was like, going to come in here and say to you I am such a cancer because I've heard you, you talk about it I know <laughs> and I'm always like you know what my it's not I'm going to say my least favorite but like the women who I always feel the most apprehensive across the zodiac the women who I always feel the most apprehensive to share my message with are the water signs so mm. cancer is a water sign Pisces and Scorpio the three water signs because the water signs are the ones who live in the emotional realm Mm -hmm. and cancer as a sign is already at default nurturing and you guys want to take care of people and you're fiercely scarily protective of the ones that you love there is this assumption that cancers are the crybabies but the reality is like you guys have a secret blade in your mouth and it's Mm -hmm. very scary when you piss off a cancer but hearing you speak about the way that you saw your husband flourish when you wrote him a list and he was really (laughs) excited to tick the things off and please you and impress you. This is what I I love to hear because men need to be, men need to be given tasks and you know what? They really want to be told that they're a good boy. Yeah, they do. And it's that whole thing of like, they do get something out of the validation that they receive from women in their lives. And even though I don't have any children yet, I still feel this sense of like, I feel like I'm doing it, I'm I'm trying to reverse engineer it where if I see myself being a person that's going to be a mother to children, then I have to spend the time I have now to observe the men around me and develop discernment that will allow me to pick the partner that is best for me. There's never going to be a perfect man. But even with your story of being a single mother for a long time, Mm -hmm. I can see why it would have been hard for you to leave the partner you had at the time because there was a child involved and there was so much more risk. And the fact that you were also starting your comedy career while being a single mom mm-hmm. and also considering leaving the partner who you had your child with is like, it's inconceivable to me how you managed to do it because there are lots of women who they don't even have any kids 
and they're in like their early 20s and they're just like mentally bound to mm-hmm. this man and that's what really motivates me to do the work I do and that's why I'm so fixated and headstrong and passionate about this because I've seen women lose their lives to this I've seen women lose their futures to this situations like yours where you manage to come out on the other side and have a thriving career and eventually partner with a man who is meant for you who makes you feel good who makes you feel the way you want to feel are in the negligible minority and Mm. that's such a shame because you're rarely going to come across men who say that they're not getting what they want to get out of women because most of them want sex from women and most men are getting what they want. But with women, it's like sex isn't always at the top of the list of our needs. Like there is that partnership and the comfort you want and to feel honoured. And what you were saying earlier about feeling bad when you wrote that list and (laughs) the evil you felt in yourself is so interesting because you were unknowingly dipping your toe into the spectrum that is dominatrix land. Where... I was doing it knowingly. <laughs> oh, is it? From listening to you. <laughs> no way! Yeah? You thought you would try something out. I did, because oh you can't get too comfortable. You can't get stagnated. And what I'm watching with my husband, even though I love him, I think I'm slowly ruining him <laughs> through this lens of devouring mother who uh, indulges people out of their own competency. So I am, as you say, a helper. I want to fix everything for everyone. I pay for everything for everyone. I'm very generous. I never say, my money, my, I'm very much, even to my teenage daughter, I'm like, our money, we work. I'm very wrong. You know what I mean? I never take ownership of like my good things and my achievements. And so everyone's really comfortable in my house. And I see my husband just getting a little bit, I don't want to say bored, but he's not stimulated. And then I know a few dominatrixes. So <gasps> I did this program where I visited fin doms and femme doms. Yes. And at first I really worried about the psychology of these men, like what happened to them as a mother. You know, right away I'm like, <laughs> I'm blaming women that I've never met. I'm like, what did their mothers do? You know, I'm mom shaming like someone I don't even know exists. Why do these men want to have their balls stepped on? Like, why am I at a cash point in the middle of Turnpike Lane and there's a pay pig on the ground? Turnpike Lane? Yeah. There's a pay pig on the ground Uh kissing a woman's feet. While leashed. He wasn't leashed. He just turned up. Oh, wow. We arranged to meet him. He turned up at the cash point. And she was fun and flirty about it. She had latex on. Gorgeous girl. And she wasn't being mean to him. I, I, I saw it. Because mm-hmm. I was able to stand at that cash point in the middle of the afternoon, by the way. Mm-hmm. Old ladies with their shopping trolleys going by. I was like, I'm just queuing. Um, and she's like, you're fucking late. You give me 100 pounds. How much are you going to give me today? And he's like, 100 pounds, mistress. He's, she's like, double it. Fuck you. And um, you could see that he enjoyed doubling it and apologizing for being late and giving it to her and getting on his knees and kissing her feet. And it was like a comedy roast. It was like consensual. Everyone was in on this game of she's going to call you a loser and you're going to give her some money. And I never would have believed it if I didn't see it for myself. I don't think that he was neglected by his mom. I don't think he was emotionally unstable. It was like a role play game that they were doing. And I left there thinking, what? Like, I've never asked a man for anything in my life. Wow. And then when I asked my husband to run a few errands, and he'll usually do them on his own, but I needed things done. He responded positively. And I thought, What's going on? Because now I'm a wife for the first time, and I'm also raising a young man. I have a son. Who would ever give me a son? (laughs) I'm creating more privileged white men. (laughs) Catherine, what have you done? I know. I'm going to send him to private school and wipe his ass and tell him he's amazing. But, um, yeah, so I think the way that I've been has maybe not been correct. So this I did it on purpose, this dominatrix thing. Just because I'm not comfortable with the whole, you know, you'll never see me pegging someone. I'm not into pegging either. I can't do it. Because it it would throw my back out, I think. Yeah. And also, I just, I think for me, I'm in a place in my life where I don't have any curiosity towards buttholes, including my own. Like, I'm just happy to not go there yet. And a heterosexual man's butthole? No. The spores. Because I'm told by my gay (laughs) friends that I should be rimming. What's um, rimming? Is that way you just lick the outer mm-hmm. ring? Yeah, but they you put your tongue inside as well, I'm told. And I just said, well, you're doing that with other gay men, and I just don't think heterosexual men 
I are think the gay right men have more of a regime for like right. hygiene. They Although do. one thing I've heard from dominatrixes is that if they do have a pegging session booked, part of the prepar- preparation that's expected is that they have the men have to come, you know, showered, clean. Okay. Are they douching? This is what I'm not sure of. Okay, so you don't... Great. Okay, so this is positive for me as well. Because I think I need to be a little bit more assertive. I need to take on a bit of, like, slum flower teachings. Yes! Like, let's let's go into this because... But I don't want to go all the way. Me neither. This is the thing. Like, I think a lot of people... And it's not their fault because it's what we're fed in media, right? Mm -hmm. When When we observe women who are dominatrixes, usually we might see them in a movie or in a sensationalized documentary where they're not given room to be a fluid, nuanced person. Mm. They're only brought on to be this sort of like shock factor talking head. But like even in movies, like it's always like, you know, latex and like get on the floor now, bitch. And like crack a whip and, you know, be really mean. But that's only one facet of exuding female dominance. There are many other parts, like foot worship is a thing. So foot worship is men who have foot fetishes Mm -hmm. and they are enthusiasts about women's feet. There are some men who are so enthusiastic about women's feet that they love to even like kiss boots, kiss shoes, kiss Crocs, kiss trainers that belong to women. You don't, yeah, you don't even have to necessarily wear boots. You can pull up to a cash meet like what you witnessed, that situation where the dominatrix arranged to meet a sub at the ATM. I've seen dominatrixes doing cash meets in their Ugg boots and leggings and their house robe. Like there is this thing where a lot of people take it very literally and think that they have to become this character outside of their self when actually it's about taking the parts of you that come the most naturally to you and bringing that in. So for me, I am quite a giggly person and I enjoy like laughing at my subs, you know, like there's a humiliation factor to it as Mm. well that a lot of men enjoy where they find pleasure in you being like, oh my God, look at the way his like butt crack is showing and his like ugly trousers. Like, oh, his bum is so small. Oh my God, like, he's so hideous. Like some men just really love the humiliation. Why is that, do you think? So I spoke with one guy who um, was a sub because when I go to events where there are dominatrixes and male subs, I sometimes in my spare time love to just ask the subs out of their origin story. Like, how did you become like right. this? <laughs> so, so you're a little Graham Norton. Literally, I'm <laughs> just there like carrying out some research because it's just so interesting. Yeah. Some of them will say things like how when they were in primary school, there was one girl, there's this one guy, he told me in primary school, there's this one girl that like he really liked her and she was always really mean to him and he she used to like push him to the floor in front of all the boys and he just secretly enjoyed it. And since then, he's just always loved dominant women. Mm. Which is quite fascinating to hear. Then I have come across men who like have the story that people love to like take that and apply it to everybody in the BDSM scene. Where this one guy told me that he had a mother who was really horrible to him. Oh no! Yes, this is what I don't want to hear. <laughs> well, this is the thing. There are some men who, but the irony is that there are some men who did have mothers who were horrible to them, but they don't have any interest in BDSM. They just. They just have taken, their trauma has taken them down a different lane. They become prime minister or whatever. Right, exactly. There are many ways to exude your, you know, malevolent male tendencies. I feel like I would be comfortable with female dominance in the kind way of, Mm -hmm. I understand the psychology of men in the world in a patriarchy have to make a lot of decisions and especially high performance men who are high earners in positions of power. Like they make a lot of decisions And so it's soothing for them to have some of those decisions taken away. Yes. So to have a dominant woman almost protect them. I I like dominance from a point of protection. Mm -hmm. I like that. Like, Mm -hmm. I got you, but you're going to have to hang the Christmas lights by tomorrow at 4 (laughs) p.m. So we would call you a mommy dom. Oh, all right. Oh, no. I I know it doesn't sound very sexy, but... There's this also... There's also something called an FLR, which is called a female-led relationship. And that's what I'm interested in, where it's essentially what you just described, Mm -hmm. where it's like you have your outlook for what you expect of your male partner. And if the majority of your ethos is about the betterment of him and his life, you can shape your dominance in that way where it's like, you know, as much as you do want the Christmas lights hung by 12, you also let's say your partner is studying some sort of PhD or something like you might sort of be involved where you're going to be like, well, I want that essay by Wednesday. Or even if he's not studying something, it could just be that like he has shown an interest in gardening 
and you maybe while you see him I don't know planting some what do people do with planting seeds or oh, something listen, my husband's all about the garden is it and he wants you see I was I think that we all have a responsibility to be invested in our relationship when we choose to be in a relationship. I love what you say when you're dating people and you're finding your feet and you're seeing what you want from a potential partner. But once you're in a marriage, mm -hmm. I feel like that is a legally binding partnership. Now we've got all these kids. And I think I've missed some of the signs that he loves the grass. He reseeds the grass. He like does all type of stuff out there. He's always filming social content about the grass. Other men get in touch because they want to know what he's doing with the grass. Um, he's very committed to the lawn. And all he wants really is for me to go out and act like I know what's happening out there and to go, ooh, <laughs> ah, yes, I do see that these seedlings are really responding to the moisture. And maybe that would be something that I could do. Yeah, I, I see where you're – okay, so I could like really be invested in his hobby. Yeah, and you could start to like – creates I mean this might feel a bit far out for you but how I'm imagining myself if I was just plonk myself into a situation and like you know when the children in um cartoons they're like three children standing on top of each other in like a detective's coat mm -hmm. like if I'm just pretending to be you right like I'll think about well how can I use the garden and gardening as something that could be a site for me to explore practicing dominance with my husband like right. I don't know what the garden looks like but I'm trying to imagine like... It looks I kind of like a golf course. So there's no flowers in there or anything? No. Like that. Oh, so is it like he just refines the yeah. way that it... He likes it to have very geometric lines oh. and really green neon looking grass. Does he explore like doing patterns on the grass? Yes, he does. So I would be like, I don't know, I might just come out, come out of nowhere to him and be like, I really like this particular pattern. I want you to do this pattern for me next when you <laughs> when you cut the oh, grass. Yeah. So give an order with it. Yeah. And like see see how see how that turns out. And then you could be like, Oh, I don't want you to cringe, but <laughs> I won't. I won't. <laughs> I feel like I'll be like, Oh, you're such a good boy. You love making me, you love making, me, like it's, obviously yeah. it has to be authentic to the way that you talk though. So you would talk to subs like that? If they do something that I, this is the thing, like if I was partnered with a sub, because my ultimate form of dominance is similar to what you're describing for yourself, where it is about being loving. Because mm. a lot of people find it hard to, which I understand, a lot of people find it hard to imagine how I'd be in an actual relationship. Like if I actually loved a man, yeah, as opposed to what I currently talk about, which is dating and sort of like finding your way around men and discerning between who's good for you or not. But I'm a very loving person and yeah. I'm a deeply protective person and I do have a very nurturing spirit and I, I get very angry at men in my life when they start to, you know, like let opportunities go or they don't meet their potential. Like I find myself taking it very personally and that's the dominant side of me that wants to see them do well. But good boy is something that I sometimes use in replacement of saying thank you. Like oh. instead of when, yeah. So like when a man does something for you, like sometimes if a man were to, I don't know, send me money or if he was to bring me a drink that I've asked for, instead of saying thank you, I'll just say good boy. <gasps> and it, it does like make men feel turned on because they don't expect you to say good boy, but also it's that validation that they want. And I think good boy is a very sort of foolproof way to practice introducing the baby steps of dominance in your partnership with a man because you're not doing anything that is requiring too much thought. I think yeah. it can be really overwhelming sometimes to attempt to create a scene. Like a scene is what we call a scenario where you and <clears throat> a male sub are in the activity, yeah. maybe you've asked him to kneel at your feet and maybe kiss your boots. You know, there is something going on. I think that is something that a lot of people jump to and think they have to do that if they want to be dominant women. When actually it's more about assuming that you have the authority to decide a man is a good boy. That's right. where it begins. And I think men really do want to be called a good boy. See, I think they do. And you, you hear <coughs> men complain, even stand-ups. When I started, now stand-up is a lot more nuanced now. We're hearing from lots of different uh, genders and socioeconomic demographics. You know, it's really alternative now. But in the beginning when I started, it was men complaining about their wives and being like, my wife was such a nag and my wife tells me to do this and that. 
But looking at, back on it now, that's such an overriding narrative of so many men in a marriage that there's something about it I think they actually like. To be like, my wife tells me what to do. Oh, my, mm -hmm. my wife tells me how to dress and it's my <laughs> wife. I think there's something about it that they like. And I just don't know. I mean, we're very happy right now, but I want to be happy for life. And through listening to you, I just think that maybe I'm not being dominant enough. But let's talk about these women who are struggling to get out of bad relationships. I've been in that position for a long time, and I love that so much of the work that you do is um, directed to them and, like, helping them. Thank you so much. I think it's, for a lot of women, like, leaving a bad relationship with a man, I think a lot of it comes down to, oftentimes, like, there is a parent that some women have, and that parent isn't good for them, but because they've never actually severed that attachment to any degree, they have no concept of detaching from something that they perceive as irreplaceable. Mm. So where I'm going with this is, I don't talk to my mother. It's been, I know, it's been But your mother five years. taught you mm -hmm. so many things mm -hmm. and you don't have a good relationship. I didn't realize At all, that. yeah. Um, I don't speak to my mom since 2018. Oh no. And yeah, it's a shame because I think every woman deserves to have a mother. However, some of us are born to mothers who just don't have the tools or the desire to change. Um, and that's the case in my experience. And so for me, my ability to walk away from men didn't actually come about until I learned how to actually view my mother for who she was and recognize that she's not going to be able to change and whilst I can accommodate that there are reasons within her control and beyond her control that she can't and won't change, I can walk away knowing that I tried. And once I walked away from my mom and I severed that attachment, mm -hmm. I developed this mental framework where any man who came into my life and I started to notice that this isn't working, I would say to myself, well, if I'm going to give this man leeway and like tolerate him being in my life when he shouldn't, then I might as well go back to my mother who created the toxicity that I spent my whole past five years detaching myself from. So in that case, then it made it easier for me to just cut men off because it's like if I can mm. cut off the most important and deepest connection in my life, then what is a man? Yeah. And it sounds really cold and a lot of people do tend to take this uh, position of like psychoanalyzing me and being like something must be wrong with her because how can you just cut off from an attachment what about love because a lot of people yeah. associate falling in love with lack of self-control and an inability to put yourself first in any way and being delusionally fogged up with emotion and just overseeing all the things a man does and not taking it as context for how he views you. Mm -hmm. For me, there is something that can be linked in cutting my mother off and being able to walk away from men. I think a lot of women have no concept of what it means to actually truly sever an attachment. And even if you have a great relationship with your parents, but for some reason you have this ongoing attachment to men there has to be one man that's got to be the experiment that you've got to be like I need to you're going to be my experiment of where I'll practice detachment yeah. another man will be your experiment of making men write lists like I just I'm in a stage in my life where with each guy there is always something that I sort of observe as like mm, this is a little case study mm. so there's a current guy who it's not romantic although he was flirting with me and maybe you've come across this in your own industry, but the men who are like, let's collaborate. So, oh, I know. Oh, so, <laughs> Let me steal your ideas and appropriate them as my own. Oh, exactly. Yeah. But it's worse than that as well. They also want to kind of like flirt with you in the process and see if at some yeah. point you'll give in and sleep with them. Yeah. So I think for me, because I'm, a lot of men see me as this sort of, um, not test, but, because I'm so headstrong in my values and I'm vocal about it and I'm immediately associated with my values, there are men who see me as like a fun challenge mm -hmm. and they believe that they can assert dominion over me and it will be such a fun ride to be the one that gets to say, well, I fucked her. So I had a guy recently come into my life who um, he 
approached me on the guise of like he wants to collaborate he wants to he wants to write with me because he's a writer as well and I thought okay this will be cool because I my work can take on so many mediums like I can I can write plays if I want to I can mm. I can do all the things because I've already created something for myself that is so adaptable so we were actually meeting up frequently and writing together for maybe like four or five months and Whilst there was very mild flirting here and there, we still were focusing on doing the work of writing together. And normally how it would work is after every writing session, he would ask me like, let's put a date in the diary for next week. And I would let him know when I'm available. So about two months ago, I let him know when I was available. <laughs> that was the last time I heard from him. He never responded to me saying I was available. Completely ghosted, but has been occasionally liking my posts on Instagram. So I know he's not died. Oh, gosh. He's still alive. But the... Like in pictures, not return in text. Right? Mm -hmm. Especially when he's the one who initiated this collaboration. Yeah. It wasn't like I came to him and pitched something. And the thing is, I always feel sort of uncomfortable when I'm receiving help from people who have more access than I do because it almost feels like I'm on their time. So for the whole duration of me knowing him, through this collaborative context, I was always sort of like, okay, well, we're still going good. I guess he's serious about this. But I would always wait for him to be the one that will initiate asking when we're next going to meet to do this work. So I, did, I never wanted to feel like I was inconveniencing his time because he's the one who's technically helping me. So now that he's ghosted, I feel like, okay, so what's probably happened here is that he's realized that he's probably not going to get to sleep with me <laughs> because... <laughs> He knows what he knows what my outlook is on men. He's spent enough time with me and he's listened to my podcast enough to know that if I'm going to be dating a man, I want to be taken care of. I don't want to be with a man who just looks nice and on the outside, like it's nice and shiny, but like I know what my requirements are of a man. And I think because he's so used to women just like flinging pussy at him because he's young and attractive and he's been on telly so many times. Like... He probably felt that with me at some point when we're meant to be writing, I'm just going to accidentally like trip over a wire and land on his dick somehow. And now here we are hooking up. Like, that never happened. It does happen a lot though. Because <laughs> it's like the greatest predictor for romance is proximity. And if you put a bunch of animals in a cage together, pandas, just keep them together long enough and like <laughs> hopefully they will mate. And it, it's worked for enough guys for yeah, sure. That... And I'm sure it's worked for him enough to think that, oh, you know, if I just hang around with her long enough let's just pretend we're writing things she's gonna fall in love with me and then I'm gonna have sex with her and it's just annoying because it's like now I feel like my time got wasted because I genuinely was like every week sort of pulling up with my iPad and my, app and my yeah. Apple pencil be like well let's write let's work thinking that he's actually serious about us working whole time I think he was just like trying to wait it out and see so you got nothing from these collaborative meetings to take away positively all I got was, you know, sort of like pointers and insight on how to write things for maybe like on screen or for on mm. stage. But I could have just, I could have watched that in a YouTube video. So like, he's mostly talking shit. It's just a lot of talking. And then got bored because he thought, oh, this is more work than I thought it was going to be. Exactly. And he's not reaping any benefit, you know, because he doesn't see hanging out with me as a benefit. He just sees that you know, the potential that we could have slept yeah. together was probably what he was banking on. But I think he realized that this is not gonna, <laughs> it's not going to happen. Well, good, because, I mean, that's a net positive, I feel like. You were a challenge. You were the Mount Everest that he thought <laughs> he could reach the summit. And he collapsed. And he was like, no, I died on the way down. Like, <laughs> so many climbers before me. I'm part of the memorial now. <laughs> oh, well, good. Paralyze. And, yeah. See, this I think a lot of women don't realize is that ghosting is such a blessing. And when Amen. someone walks out of your life, let them go. And I have chased so many men back into my life just because of that initial panic that now with age, I know in hindsight that panic fades. But even bad men, even men that I ended up breaking up with later, they were correct. So my last boyfriend was a really good guy and we're still very good friends but we weren't right for each other. And when he split up with me the first time, I absolutely panicked. I always loved him when he was in a different country. Mm -hmm. And then when he was in my space, I was like, ugh, we're not right together. So we went to another country and he split up with me and I lost it. I just panicked. I thought, I need to get him back. This is the best man I've ever been with. I have to get him back. I have to get him back. I got him back. And I was like, oh no. And then we just 
split again. And that was the most amicable split that I've ever had. And I had no business dragging him back. He was absolutely <laughs> right. It was actually his grandfather who told him to split up with me. <gasps> Why? Just what was the reason? cultural differences. Oh, cultural his differences. His grandpa was like, no, you don't want to be with that girl. And his grandpa is a very clever man. Very accomplished. Shout out to grandpa. I know. I got dumped by your grandpa. <laughs> um, so what you said about your mother and love, I mean, I think like love is blind, right? They always go, love is blind, love is blind. And I think we've romanticized that. But what it means is that when this chemical re response of feeling sexual, romantic love with a man is present, then you are blind to red flags and you lose your boundaries and often you lose a sense of who you are. And that's really dangerous. And then children, even children who are in a cycle of abuse, they love their parents. Oh, 100%. Because you always love your parents. So it's mm -hmm. actually very adult to be able to break free from that like childlike just r sense of love and go, well, there's love and then there's love, but this love violates so many of my boundaries that it's not safe for me anymore and I'm out. And I think that it's very sad, you know, for me to hear what's going on with you and your mother. Like, that sucks. Obviously, it's not ideal. Especially you being a mom. Yeah, I know. I'm, like, so caught up in, like, a mom thing right now. So I hate hearing that you've had to be adult enough at your young age to sever this relationship with your mom because you asserted your own boundaries. And then now you've been able to use this with men. And I think out of so many tragedies comes a silver lining and it's like all right well you know the greatest love this love that we're supposed to really put on a pedestal you were able to notice like okay that's not right for me and now you can do it just so easily with men and that's like such a gift that so many of us don't have I've been in love like in love with <laughs> really awful terrible men and I feel like I've been cheated on loads and it's funny the messages women get because even the people who were supposed to love me, my friends, my family, the people who were really supposed to protect me the most would say to me during times of infidelity. And actually I had a therapist too who was like, why do you care that he's cheated on you? He has violated so many of these boundaries, this boundary, that boundary. He's an asshole. He does this. He takes advantage of this. But cheating is the one thing that you get upset about. And I feel like that's maybe the most, for me anyway, personal one. Like that's my real red card in a relationship. It makes me feel just so rejected. It's a, it's a terrible feeling for most people. Mm -hmm. But all the people in my life would say to me, don't tell anyone. Just keep it to yourself. As in don't tell anyone you're cheating? Don't tell anyone. And I feel like I noticed that. Even back then when I was in a cycle of dating bad men and holding on to bad men, <clears throat> I feel like even in my 20s, I would recognize this message of absorbing another man's recklessness as your own shame. Like being like, well, why wouldn't I tell anyone? They go, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone because we know what you're like, Catherine. You're probably going to forgive him. You're probably going to take him back. And that would be really embarrassing for you. <laughs> so don't tell anyone. Just keep that to yourself. And I would think... Well, hang on. So before I behaved in the right way, I think a lot of your listeners might be women who are in the first steps of becoming better and more authentic, where they are listening to you say the right things and they're agreeing and like, yes, that's the right thing. I shouldn't tolerate this and that. But maybe they're still tolerating it in their normal life. Mm -hmm. And they're just on the cusp of translating that, hang on, this isn't right. This doesn't feel right to then actually actioning it in their real lives. Because I, for years I was like, well, it's not my shame. Why wouldn't I fucking tell everyone? And then I started telling everybody everything. Um, <laughs> and you have a podcast where yeah, you tell everyone everything. I do. I like almost <laughs> as a, like a reflex. I tell everybody everything because I'm like, why would I just hold that shame? It's not my, my shame to have. <clears throat> and then I started getting out of relationships. But I, I would always, the worse a man would treat me, sometimes I would hold on even stronger because it is shameful. For some reason, because of all this messaging, when a man is treating you really badly, you go, oh, no, like everyone thinks I'm the strong person. Oh, no, everyone expects a lot of me. And if I tolerate this, I'll lose people's respect. And I, ha I am alienated now from my friends and family because I'm embarrassed to speak to them because they know. And, oh, what am I going to do? Well, I have an idea. If I can just turn it all around, mm -hmm. if I can just fix this man and show <laughs> everyone that he's wonderful – none of this other horrible stuff ever happened. And I feel like that's what these women are holding on to. They're sitting at a slot machine 
I'm pulling the lever. I'm putting quarters in the slot machine forever and ever and ever. And they think there's going to be a jackpot out of nowhere, but the house always wins. And they feel like if I step away from this slot machine, the next woman to sit down is going to pull it once and get this amazing jackpot. Well, no, the casino's taking all her money as well. So it's just- the idea of like, <clears throat> you know, the longer you spent making a mistake, you might as well just stay yeah. so that you don't let that time go to waste. But then in effect, more of your future is going to waste because you're just hacking away at this thing that was always never going to work. And I think it's a pride thing for a lot of women as well, where there is that shame in walking away. But then what's interesting about what you were saying in regards to don't tell anyone you were cheated on, I actually do believe in like having the people in your community, like your own safe space, who mm. you vent to. Oftentimes that might be the women in your life. The only people I believe in not telling that you're cheated on is like if you're out dating and <laughs> you meet a new man. Yeah. So I talk about this a lot on my podcast where I believe in doing this thing where I create a phantom ex based on all the best parts of various men I've dated so that it doesn't feel like I'm lying and it feels easier to just roll it out as I'm saying it because this phantom ex represents the things that I expect from a man, Mm. things that I enjoy the most from a man. And when you meet a new guy, oftentimes to try and catch you out or to try and morph into what they expect, what they think you expect so they can sleep with you quicker, they will ask you, what do you look for in a man? Which I usually answer that with, I'll know when I see it. Because when I used to be (laughs) like, oh, he needs to do X, Y, Z and do all these things. They're either going to start debating you, which is a huge turn off. And then you find yourself fighting for your life, explaining your values. And then they they use the semantics to try and catch you out. And then you're just not on a date anymore. You're now in this debate that like some question time type situation. Yeah. Or they just pretend to be the guy you just described. But if instead... When a man asks you, so what are you looking for in a guy? And you just say, I'll know when I see it. Um, But from all of my dating experiences, generally, I've just had such a great... You could be lying through your teeth. They will not know. Generally, from all my dating experiences, I've just always dated men who take care of me good, who want to spoil me, who (laughs) 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 Who want to spoil me. In fact, my last ex, oh my God, like he was so sweet. He surprised me on a trip to Bali. He supported me loads when I was paying for my grandma's mortgage. You got to make up a grandma who had a mortgage. All these things, right? And I know that a lot of women don't like lying. But the problem is that men are lying most of the time, especially when you've newly met them, because they want to create a version of themselves that you're most likely to sleep with. So when you've created this phantom ex, that sounds amazing. This guy is probably going to ask. So like, this sounds amazing. Why did it end? Oh, he had to move far away for his job. You know, Ah. move to Australia. (laughs) I always say they move to Australia because... You know, it's a faraway place. Yeah. It's really hard to be long distance with someone who right. is in a whole new time zone. And in me explaining that I've always dated men who treat me the way I want to be treated, that man now feels like he has to either meet me at that level that I'm used to or he's going to have to go above and beyond because most men are in competition with hypothetical men who don't even exist. Right. Like They're in competition with each other. And I observe this from being in in environments where you know like I so this is like such random tea but I used to be a stripper Mm -hmm. and when I worked in the strip club I felt like I was in this sort of like anthropological research environment where I'm like observing all the mammals and like how the men would (laughs) behave with the women and the interesting psychological ways you can like play with men and you worked at Hooters. So it's a, yeah. obviously it's, Hooters is not a strip club, but you know, titties are out like in a bra, of course, like it is about like using your feminine charm and presence to be a salesperson in an environment where people enjoy the appeal of you being there. And so I noticed that Being in an environment where men understand that the only way they're going to get access to you is they're going to literally have to pay or they're going to literally have to pander to your ego or flirt with you in a way that's very flattering. When I take that experience and I sort of like paste it onto the outside, outside vanilla world, it's not that I'm expecting every man I meet to just be an ATM, but I do understand that there is a psychology, there is a psychology to flirting with men and you really do have to create a 
you have to instill a fear of scarcity in their minds where they have to feel like they're never going to meet anyone like you again. And the reason why they feel like they will feel like that is if, for example, they ask for your number, like you make them work for the number, like you make them feel like people don't just get your number. Like he has to give you three reasons why, even if you've had such a fun conversation with him and he thinks he's going to get this number, you now throw a curveball and you're like, well, give me three reasons why I should give you my number. <laughs> and I enjoy doing things like that because from stripping, that also sort of like desensitized me to this sort of scarcity that most women feel towards men, <clears throat> where it's this whole idea of like, you never know, he could be the one. Men are everywhere. <laughs> so much so that the men who you think are gonna be the one are just regular men and I think we project a lot of wonder onto men and I think it comes from this idea that you know I don't have to I shouldn't have to change anything about who I who I am to be loved and I fundamentally agree that as we all are we deserve to be loved and accepted and at the same time I think if you are meddling romantically with men you do need to curate a version of yourself that you know that you can live up to meaning that there has to be a version of yourself that isn't going to let things slide anyhow, mm -hmm. especially in the early stages, because I think the early stages is the most fundamental <laughs> with men where, you know what you're talking about with ex-boyfriends who have ghosted you and you've like scrambled to get them back. Now that I'm getting a bit older, because I used to be a victim to ghosting too, like I used mm. to take, because it is an ego injury when someone disappears on you, you feel like you have no value and you feel like you're forgettable. Oh. And it hurts so much and you're young and it's this pain. It's a very physical pain. Yes. That you're like, I want to run out Anguish. of my body somehow and I don't know how. And he's such a bad guy. I know that. But he's also the guy that's going to make me feel better about this bad guy. That's also him. So if mm -hmm. I could just get him back for now, mm -hmm. I'll deal I'll with it later. Back. I feel like that's why it takes, I always say 18 months from a real deal breaker incident like infidelity or a, anything that is a real deal breaker in your relationship. I think if you're a woman like me, when I was younger anyway, if you are invested in this romantic entanglement and you're in love, then it takes 18 months to really get over that. And I, every relationship I've looked back and I've said, it was the end was 18 months ago, but I held on and I tried and I tried and all I did was waste 18 months of my life. And yes. one of my girlfriends said to me, cause I said, well, I have to stay with him. It's already been such and such a time. And she goes, yeah, but the what's worse than spending two years with the wrong man is spending two years plus one day. She's like, you can get out today. And I was like. <sighs> and once you get out today, you can meet a man next week <clears throat> yeah. who can create an experience that completely tops what you were dealing with. And it comes down to how much your mindset changes in that week, because there are a lot of women who struggle deeply with self-control. And mm -hmm. I think that's what makes the ghosting so triggering for them, because ghosting is this sort of, it creates an ego injury. And to heal that injury, you want to take your power back by proving to that guy that you are unghostable. So, you know, when he returns and you you feel yourself regulated again and yeah. you, you know, you're, you're calm, your heart rate is back to normal. And that's worrying if somebody can have that kind of physical effect on you. And I think that power is manufactured in our own minds. Like mm. we just chose to give that man power. He's literally, like sometimes I feel like I have to do this thing where it's the equivalent of, you've probably seen this video flying around on the internet of a woman who's just like lying on her tummy in a park and then the camera's like zooming out and then you can see the whole town she's in, the camera zooms out, you can see the whole country she's in, camera zooms out, you can see the entire continent she's on, camera zooms out, you can now see the whole of planet Earth, camera zooms out even more, you can see the moon in the shot, camera zooms out more, you can see the whole solar system camera zooms out couple galaxies before you know it, all you're seeing is just dots on the screen of like mm. thousands of galaxies and the whole point of that short video is to remind you of how small minuscule, minuscule mm. and meaningless you and everything around you is in the grand scheme of things of course when we zoom back in everything carries meaning and everything is so mm. personal and potent but that is something I used to remind myself that Men only matter as much as I decide they do, especially when I've just met them. Like when you're meeting someone and you're clicking with them, that feeling of symmetry and ro romance and harmony with that person 
builds this idea in your mind that this is the man for you. And it's like, oh, oh my no. God, we're compatible. And then the worst thing in the world is to discover that you're not compatible. And it's like incompatibility actually, is, actually isn't the worst thing ever. And sometimes no. you're just not compatible with a man. And what you said earlier about like ghosting is a gift. I'm like, yeah, I'm always grateful when a man ghosts me for reasons people might not expect me to say, but because it's like, ah, you almost had me there. I'm glad you ghosted because now I can just <laughs> come back to the reality of like, I knew it. But also the best thing to do, I feel, is block their number. And this mm -hmm. is advice I give to my friends. Block your, their number so that you're not jumping to your phone every time it vibrates. Think, is it, is it, if you block their number, you know he's not calling because you've taken your power back somehow. Even if he wasn't calling anyway, block his number and keep it blocked because he will be back in touch. I said to one of my girlfriends, he, if you don't go chasing him, he will be back in touch. Just wait and see how long it takes. A year later, this guy got back in touch. Oh, you know, I'm sorry for the way I treated you, da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And after a year, you have the strength to then come back and say, no, you didn't make me feel any type of way. I understood back then that you fumbled the ball that had nothing to do with me. <laughs> you don't have access to me now. And I think if women thought of themselves as like countries and really were careful about who you give security clearance to, Ooh. like make them Come on, TSA. go through it. Well, it's real. <laughs> and then and then relinquish that access. And I think when you speak in terms of access, that's when I started to get stronger, when I had people mistreat me and I would just cut them off, not ghost them, mm -hmm. but clearly just say, this is inexcusable behavior. You no longer have access to me. And they go, what? And then you have to mean it and go, no access. And then you block them on every social platform, phone, email. You move if you have to move. No longer have access. And that, if you think being ghosted hurts your feelings, silence is universal language. If you just never speak to a man again, he can't call you crazy. He can't twist your words. He can't make up. Some reason that, oh, she did it. Did. No, nope. silent. And it kills them. And they will remember you for the rest of their life. Forever. Forever. And also the key <clears throat> word you said there is you have to mean it. A lot yeah. of women, they're not serious people. Like they will do the whole spiel you just said of like, yeah, I'm done with you. That's un unacceptable. Do not speak to me again. And then they just go back on their word. And then, you know, the man might come back with something measly and then they'll <laughs> just fall for it. And it's like, girl, you're supposed to stand firm. He's going to try and see if his attempt to yeah. throw a pinball at you will work. And Well, how do you fight against biology? Because the way that you speak and the strength that you have, I think that part of the reason why it's so d just destructive, whatever you want to call it, what's the word? divisive <clears throat> it's divisive but it's um not, what's the word not destructive not like it's um it's like destructive we'll pause for a minute and think of this word because i can't go on without it hmm. i think what you're getting hmm. at is it's disruptive disruptive because okay. i'm sick it's and divisive joined together i'm gonna sue beecham okay <laughs> i think the way you speak and the way that your power is so disruptive is because it's it's unique, but also it goes against thousands of years of biology. And I think that this is what women can forgive themselves for, is that for so long, men were living in these communities and these tribes where they would impregnate loads of different women in the community and everyone was fine with that. And their like sperm sort of goes all over the place. Even now, like do men know where all their sperm is? Certainly not. But we know we get like one egg maybe <laughs> at my age, I'm not sure, every month. And we keep it with us and we know where it is all the time. <laughs> and then if it's fertilized, it grows within us. And then we, no matter what else happens, have to pour all of our energy into raising this little person for at least four years. And I think that, you know, we've all read these anthropological. <laughs> I know, right? Anthropological. We've all read, yeah. These, we've all read these anthropological studies of like, we have to stick around. And that's why we fall in love. And when men come, they release testosterone, except for when they're in love. And that's the only time they release oxytocin. But we're just oxytocin, oxytocin mm -hmm. all the time, falling in love every time. And so when you come out with some of these truths, even though we know them, like I think some of your listeners don't have the strength to fully embody them like you do because we're fighting thousands of years of this other thing. So how do you 
have that strength up against mm-hmm. such a system. So how I create and maintain that strength is you have to make a focal point. Mm-hmm. And I'm a very deeply emotional person. I'm really, really sensitive. A lot of people have this impression, which I don't blame them for having that impression because my work is very like, you know, cutthroat and literal. But I'm a very, very sensitive person mm-hmm. and I am easily affected by men if I don't have my firewall up, right. my Norton antivirus. <laughs> so when it comes to creating a focal point, my focal point is always remember how it felt when that man ghosted you. Mm. Remember how it felt when you noticed that his energy started to change towards you. Remember how that ruined your day. Remember, because the reality is like, you can have standards and boundaries and frameworks in place to protect yourself, but you're still going to have feelings. Mm. It's about how you use those feelings to shape the way you respond to men because all men are going to see is your response. They're not at home thinking, oh, I've really hurt her feelings and she's really dysregulated right now and she's not eating very well right now because I've ignored <laughs> her. They're probably just like, whatever. Like, they, because... I love the revenge body thing where women <laughs> go, I know what I'll do. Hunger strike. And I'm like, <laughs> he told you to go away. And so you just started to go away. You just got smaller and smaller. And you think he's going to care. Why don't they care? The reason why men don't care is because... They only care when you stop caring. If you are more emotionally invested, men can see that. That's why I really keep on banging on that the beginning stage is the most important because that's where you really lay the framework for who you are and what you'll tolerate. I think a lot of women overinvest in men and that's why they end up feeling betrayed and that's why they end up feeling like, it's not over even though it's over and that's why when a man ghosts they have to go and get something off him some sort of non-existent thing where they feel like they've lost something because they've given too much I think a lot of women rush to nurture men a lot of women are in a hurry to fast track the love and romance they want to feel Mm. and they assume that that's going to happen by pouring into men who have done nothing to invest in them and it's so embarrassing like I'm very easily embarrassed like These days, I think it's something I need to look into. Maybe it might be like my PMS as I'm like getting a bit older. I said, because I'm like turning 29 this month, and I noticed that my body is changing a bit. Like psychologically, I'm changing where I keep getting these random flashes of like things I've done that I'm embarrassed by. And it like, (laughs) like for maybe like 10 seconds, it will rob me of my peace. (laughs) And then I have to remember that nobody's thinking about this as much as I am. It's just me having a invasive delusion. But the embarrassment, that men have caused me is part of what motivates and inspires me to not recreate that embarrassment. And sometimes the embarrassment is so menial, but as long as I felt impacted by it, it's enough for me. Like I'm very, very adamant that I don't like when men make me feel discarded. And sometimes you can feel discarded when you have review the situation, you realise, yeah, I was giggling too much. Yeah, I was actually giving him too much power. You know, sometimes like when I'm in the presence of men, I have to sometimes learn to just hold the laugh in. Like, I'm not going to give you too many laughs. Like, you're funny, but you're not that funny. Mm. And it's it's not that I'm being this inauthentic version of myself, but it's about me using the time I have with this man to be discerning. With women, I'm so much more relaxed yeah. and I don't feel this sense of having to have my shoulders up tight and be like walking around with my monocle, looking for the floor and looking for the, aha, I got you. Because the power dynamics are more even with women. And, you know, whilst it might be argued that, you know, you still got to watch out for certain women, they might want to, you know, use you for opportunities or they want to use you for X, Y, Z. That's always going to exist in humanity. But the difference with women using you for opportunities or women trying to use you to get to a man they like versus men trying to use you for sex or men trying to use you as a place to dump their anger. And in effect, that could end your life right it's very two different kind of stakes high here and I just wish that women were more cognizant of the risk they're at when they're interacting with men because if we can all agree that men kill women then I think we all need to be a bit more strict and discerning with how we just give ourselves away to men we can all agree that men kill women you say that and people go well men kill men men too the the biggest victims of homicide are men and you go, yes, that's the point. Who's killing them? <laughs> Diabetes? Like other men are killing them. Men are killing <laughs> everyone. 
oh, well, it's this group of people. It's this ethnicity that well, on both sides of that, it's men. Oh, well, it's and I think that we have to start there. Like there are people who still will disagree. Yeah. It's not all men thing. It's like mm-hmm. Catelyn Moran is a, you know, wonderful, wonderful feminist and writer and really funny woman. She said, and again, it's brave to say because you know that it's going to be met with debate, aggression. She said, being a woman is like living on a planet of bears. And sometimes the bears are cute and cuddly. But at the end of the day, they're still bears. And I totally, totally get what she's saying. It's like there's this this low-level vibration of um, vigilance and assessment always. And I heard some young girls speaking the other day in my kitchen, my daughter's friends, and they're only 14. And I heard them talking about a young woman in the news who'd lost her life. And when I was growing up, there was a girl in my school who lost her life for ending a relationship. And um, they said, well, I know what I'll do. I'll just never break up with a man. I'll never leave. I'll never do anything like that to upset him. And then I'll never lose my life. And I went, 2023, I got teenagers at my kitchen table talking about this. And I was like, oh my God, what are we going to do? I think what's scary about imagining that scenario of, you know, I'll never leave so that I won't lose my life is there are still women who lose their lives in marriages that yeah. they should have left. So there's literally no way out. Like if you leave, you're at risk. If you stay, you're at risk. Mm-hmm. And that just points to the overall reality that men are dangerous people. And I think a lot of women choose to be ignorant to that when discussions of the nature we're having come up because it puts those women in a place of responsibility to be more discerning and it's not about victim blaming and saying that you know if you're not discerning enough then it's your fault rather it's saying that because men are so dangerous there are tools you can use to be a bit more vigilant and that vigilance can it can save your life and sometimes Mm -hmm. it can improve the quality of your life I just really, I'm strongly rooted in the belief that just because you have a connection with a man shouldn't be the entire basis as to why you partner with him. There has to Mm -hmm. be more than that. And it's something you said that made me laugh about, um, is it never marry a man on his first try? Yeah. Like, (laughs) never marry (laughs) a man. He needs to be humbled by his first wife. He does. And I had a lot of first wives reach out and get really pissed (gasps) about that. Why? Because it taps into this deep insecurity, this fear that they have that they tolerated all this shit. And after 16 years of tolerance and of martyring themselves, it was over anyway. And then he went and found someone else and treated them right. And that is the fear. When you're with a bad man, you go, I am not manipulating this correctly. I'm doing something. He's going to be nice to her. He's going to go off and have this wonderful family. And when I say that, I get all these ex-wives who are like, he did it to dead. I'm like, oh, I didn't mean to offend you. Yeah, I'm certainly not a homewrecker. My husband was only married for a really short time and they didn't have any kids. And I think they have like a fine relationship. I don't know. But but this belief that, yeah, like I, if I had invested in my husband when we first met, when we were teenagers, he was an asshole then, um, just a really like little punk like went on to be a professional athlete had people like licking his ass I don't even need to do any rimming in my marriage he's had his ass metaphorically licked his whole (laughs) life everyone being like oh you're so amazing you're so handsome you're so great if I'd been married to him then I just can't imagine who I'd be dealing with and meeting him again when he was 35 after he'd been through some challenges you know had to navigate a marriage and live in different countries and work and just have some have a real life I don't think men are ready to begin until they're at least 35. I really don't. Maybe a few very I'll say even later than that. <laughs> yeah. Honestly. My husband's third wife is going to be <laughs> great. <laughs> After he's been taught a lesson by me. Let's hope that doesn't happen. Annie gets half my money. She's going to have a no! wonderful time. She's going to have a great oh, husband. His God. fourth wife. Oh, I mean, she'll really oh, yeah. be living. Sailing. <laughs> yeah. This is so interesting because I get a lot of pushback from women when I say that I if I'm going to marry a man, because I don't see myself being married, like not for another 10 years or maybe like seven or eight, because I just, I just don't feel like it's something I need to rush into doing. But if I'm going to be married, I'm going to marry a man that's like 20 something years older than me. And people are like, ew, that's disgusting. So you're going to sleep with an old man. It's like, but even if you was to marry a man who's the same age as you right now and 
God willing, things go according to your plan and you both grow old together, you're still going to fuck an old man at some point if yeah. you guys, you know, are both still feeling like doing things at that time. But it's the whole idea of, like, people's minds just go to sex when I talk about marrying an older man as opposed to what I know that I can expect from an older man, which is that he has been humbled by women and he's probably already had kids and... Yeah there is less expected of me. And because I'm younger, I have more leverage. And I do think in a way that is very um, strategic because, you know, women are expected to be strategic everywhere in their lives, except with their partners. Like you're expected to be strategic with your career. Yeah. Because it requires strategy to get to where you've gotten to. Oh, and yeah. you would know this, Catherine. But then suddenly when it comes to partnering with men, people just expect you to just like throw everything in the air and hope it lands in the place it should land. And it's like, that's just not how life works. If you want to be with a particular man who can create a particular lifestyle, maybe because that lifestyle matches yours or because you want to experience something more exciting, you're going to have to be in environments where you're likely to meet that kind of man. Mm -hmm. You're going to need to pick men who have gone for a particular life stage where they're likely to have the amount of money that would meet the lifestyle you desire. Like a lot of men, they're not going to experience making the money that they could be making until later in their lives because of how certain careers work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of men who are in positions of power in their careers are a little bit older. You know, a lot of times women of my age and younger, you know, in their earlier 20s, they expect that the young boy who they fancy is going to be able to pay all their bills and take them shopping and do all the fun things. And it's like, but he's he's barely even established himself and that's where I actually surprisingly agree that yeah. there is too much pressure being put on young men because you guys are picking the wrong targets like <laughs> you can't expect a young man to facilitate a lifestyle that most times it's older men that can facilitate and yeah. that's why I believe it's like yes it is possible to put too much pressure on a man if you pick the wrong man mm -hmm. and if you're too woman for him and you are too self-aware, then of course you're gonna put pressure on the wrong person. But if you pick someone who is ready and self-directed in his ability to want to please you and who understands what you expect, you're not putting any pressure on him. Mm. So I think it comes down as well to the context of like why women pick certain men. So I think a lot of women pick men who are gonna rely on them. Um, and sometimes it's like, I get a lot of pushback from like the breadwinner feminists who like strongly identify with being a breadwinner. What is it about those women that you think so, they don't vibe I, with what you're saying? I think the breadwinner feminist women, which is- that's what I am. But the thing is, it's like, you're not in my comments being like, yeah, but this sounds so loveless and vapid. What do you mean you want to be with a man who's going to take care of you? Taking us back to the seventies. First of all, I'm not taking any of you with me when I find this man. <laughs> <laughs> Second of all, you are, you're taking half their money <laughs> because he was right? their first husband. Exactly. So all you starter wives, <laughs> get ready. Do you but think that your position threatens the starter wives? Yes. Mm. I think my position threatens the starter wives and the breadwinner wives. With the breadwinner wives, I think a lot of women base the premise of their identities on being a breadwinner because... I think there is reason for them to think it's an achievement. Like, I think it is an amazing thing to be able to provide for a full family and a man included. Like, that is incredible, especially as a woman, mm -hmm. where we are economically disadvantaged. The problem is that a lot of women that I've come across are secretly resentful of their position. You know, like, they are a breadwinner, but then they feel like their husband's becoming a couch potato and they find themselves having to do even more labor at home because the man has sort of like decayed into the inactivity. And a lot of these women have been cheated on. But <laughs> so this goes back to why I came here today is that I don't think my husband's a couch potato. I don't think he's cheated on me. I don't think he's decayed, but I'm able to recognize the culture that we live in See, our marriage is five years old. What happens when our marriage is 20 years old? What can I do today to keep my stay-at-home husband in a society that very much shames that role, stimulated, interested in our marriage, challenged? And I came to you for the answer that is I need to lovingly dominate him, I feel is the answer. Mm -hmm. And so why aren't these women, instead of being in your comments, arguing with you, why aren't they coming to be taught something. It, and again, it's because maybe they're resistant to the change that it will take. 
I think they're resistant to the change it will take. And I think a lot of women are not comfortable being dominant. Like a lot of women no. enjoy the idea of like being, being the breadwinner, but still expecting that man to like uphold fundamentally like patriarchal behaviors. And I think a lot of men feel emasculated when they are being bred one by women. Like what is it even called when your wife's like, I don't know. They just feel very, um, unable to exude a kind of dominance and the women who I've come across who their their male partners have cheated on them like those men have often cheated with women who are impressed by the little that those men have like they might go for like really really young women who have fewer oh needs and God. fewer expectations that's why I'm so hell-bent on encouraging young women like my work is for people who are like I think 21 is still a bit young. I think from 25 is when you yeah. need to get serious because I think you should give a portion of your 20s to dating broke men, date men who can't do anything for you, do all that falling in love, fluffy stuff, get ghosted, experience all the reasons why you don't want to feel like that again. So that from 25, you have your head screwed on and you're dating in a direction that reflects where you want to be in your life. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes I think the women who are scared to embrace any kind of dominance, feel like they don't deserve anything. And that's often why they're in positions where they're the ones who are funding the lives of men because they don't know how to receive. So my work is really harrowing for them because it's like, here I am yapping about, yeah, spend his money and, and don't feel bad about it. And yeah, if a man loves you, he should be invested in you. And they're like, yeah, but that doesn't sound very loving. That sounds transactional. That's their favorite yeah. transactional. And it's like, Every interaction is a transaction. Friendships are a transaction. That's why when one person starts ghosting the other, the friendship changes because you're not taking, you're not playing your role anymore in yeah. that friendship. But also, I don't think the word transaction is entirely awful. I think people try to demonize things that they don't know how to do because it makes them feel better about not being able to do it. When actually, I don't think every single woman has to behave like me. I think there are elements you can take and leave what you don't need. Mm -hmm. And I just think that if you are already in a position where you're a breadwinner woman, you you can just really have fun with that dominance without obviously you don't have to like demean him or if he's not into being humiliated then yeah. you don't have to humiliate him and call him a little bitch but there are ways to really like have fun, have fun with this power that you have and it's like small baby steps and like oftentimes the things that you feel cringe or embarrassed to try are usually the things where like there's fun in that power and mm. because you've already been with that person for so long there's no sense that like, oh, he's gonna leave me if I like call my tits mommy milkers. Like, you know, like. <laughs> Mine are though. <laughs> so I can't say that. I'm actually lactating all the time. I've been pregnant for like four years. Oh my God. And if he doesn't like it, he can go get a job. Oh. These men, you know what I mean? Like, are these high performance exactly. women just need to give it a go, I feel like. I'm telling you, like, this could be totally oh. the wrong thing in my marriage, but I'm gonna try it. Like, it's all about trying it in a way that feels authentic to how you already yeah. are. Like, again, what I was saying about like calling him a good boy once in a while, or, you know, like when he wears a particular kind of, I don't know, like if you wanna see him wearing stripes this week. <laughs> I don't care. That's the thing. I feel like these women are so like, spent because they're looking after their kids and they're looking after their business and then they're coming home and they're still doing a lot of the housework and their men are like good men but then they see you here's receiving. me being like I don't do anything for men and they're like fuck you that's horrible that's why you're never gonna find love bitch like people telling me that I'm yeah. broken people um because basically I have such a confidence in how I think because I just don't feel like I'm missing out on anything. Like even if I don't end up finding a man that I marry or have kids with, I don't feel like I've missed out on my life. I feel like I've lived yeah. a very funny, random ass, adventurous mm. life of not being bound to a man. I think a lot of women have missed out on their freedom. But the best part is it's actually never too late. Mm -hmm. It's never too late to start again. It doesn't matter if like you're in your early 50s and you've left a 13 year marriage. Like... You're outside. You you can just go out and socialize and explore and just... I mean, especially now when you look at the world, you look at the state of the world and you are going through a divorce and maybe you don't want to leave your boyfriend or maybe you got ghosted. I think now is the most perfect time to turn the news on for five minutes and go, do you know what? I'm young and I'm healthy and I'm beautiful and I'm free and like nothing else really matters. I'm not going to cry because some man showed me who quite clearly is. who he is and I 
got a lucky escape, you know, like I'm out and I can do anything. I feel like I agree that it's never too late. And the older women are the ones that you can see suffering the most because there'll be so many marriages. It's about to be the holidays. You know, people go back and they see their parents. And I hear so many people my age being like, my dad's fun, but my mom's gone crazy. I'm like, what do you mean your mom's crazy? Mm -hmm. Oh, my dad's so much fun, but my mom's just got really like withdrawn and cross as she gets older. But again, I think that these women absorb different behaviors, internalize them, and they become resentful. And that's why they're reaching out in your comment section. They're so angry about things that they tolerated and they carry that heaviness. And then you see the men dancing around. Men will drink and smoke their whole life and live to be 100. And you have these wives at home like wringing their fingers, like anxious. They've given birth to like eight kids. You know, they're like um, bladders falling out. You know, they're like, oh, but I'm in love. It's like, <laughs> hang on. Like at what point are you going to advocate for yourself? And that I think that would be my biggest fear in a long-term marriage. Because like you, I was very happy being single. I didn't want to be in a partnership. I dated some losers. I dated a guy that was nice. And then I was alone. And I felt so free. And I felt so authentic. And that I could just enjoy my own company and move through the world, not being accountable to anyone or anything. And then I met my husband. And it's like the cliche of like, when you're not looking for it, that's when it falls into your lap. And he is the right person. Because that is how it happens. It is. And I was 35. I was the right age. But... Um, if I looked at the rest of our lives, I'm like, oh my gosh, we're supposed to be together now for like at least 40 more years. And my biggest fear would be that we just settle into this thing where I become one of these resentful women. Mm. That's like, well, I never really spoke up for myself. I just wanted everyone else to be happy. And, um, I think that's when marriages start to drift apart. I think who can be attracted to that? You know, do you enjoy sitting with yourself? When you're like mad about the world and you don't love your husband and you feel resentful and you feel like you missed out, you don't want to be around you. So like, why is he going to want to be around you? Leave him, be by yourself, find someone else or work it out before it gets to that point. Especially emphasis on leave him. Like I do believe in, you have to instill fear in men. Like they need to know that there are consequences. <laughs> yeah, yeah like leave emphasis him. on leave him. You have to let men know there are consequences. Like even with him being married, like, Sometimes you're going to have to confiscate the pussy and put it away in the attic. Like, you, mm. like I do believe that sleeping with men... This is something that, again, I get a lot of pushback for, where I talk about, like, sleeping with men, giving men sexual access is a tool and it is a way to assert leverage. It's also a way to bond with your partner, mm -hmm. but a lot of women only see it as just bonding, bonding, bonding. They don't see it as anything outside of that. They don't recognise that, like, there's also power in choosing to not sleep with a man because you sometimes have to really assert your point by going on pussy strike. And you know, some women, what catches them slipping is their own horniness. Like mm. you almost feel like you're punishing yourself. Yeah. I've been there. I understand the feeling of like, you know, oh, I need to put my foot down and not sleep with him, but I'm feeling horny. So I'm going to go now. So <laughs> I feel like you're in your twenties and pussy strikes are a real young woman's game because I'm 40 now. And when my husband and I are kind of, feeling a little bit disconnected. Like, we haven't had any real problems. But I feel like if I initiated a pussy strike, then it would just go on for a year. Like, he, I don't think he would really <laughs> challenge me on it. And then we wouldn't have slept together in a year. And then our marriage would be in real trouble. <laughs> so anytime that I've been a little bit annoyed with him, I initiate, like, a, a pussy party where Ooh, we have to have this. sex, like, three times that week. We have to have sex as much because as possible. Because he's in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> I, I might be doing it backwards, but I just feel like... This is so fascinating. <clears throat> in a marriage, when you're old, a pussy strike can go on a long time because wow. no one on either side of the picket line is willing to budge and everyone's old and no one has the sex drive that they used to. <laughs> and then you turn around and you could be best friends just living in a house together. And I don't want that. So if we're that not getting amazing. along, then we have sex more and then we just sort of wow. are friends again. You wait. See, because you're I mean... married, like there's a lot more nuance and layers to your relationship and how the foundations have been formed. And this is why I'm so fascinated about marriage as a concept because, and it's also why I'm not in a hurry to be married because no. I know that once I'm married, there will be things that, like sometimes you're not gonna physically be able to ghost him, can you? Like you live in the same house, you know? Whereas if you're just dating, you can just turn your phone off and not talk to him and he's gonna have to live with not hearing from you. So there's different things that happen in marriage where it's, it's sometimes it's differently harder 
Because you could, in a marriage, I suppose, ghost someone. And there have been times that we've been quiet. I just haven't really felt like chatting to my husband. And there's definitely a heaviness in the house. But then I have a teenager and I have small children. And you never want to talk through the children. Like, yeah. well, daddy's going to do this and did it. And it just makes it really awkward for everyone. So that's why I feel like rather than a pussy strike, the pussy party just moves things along quickly. But again, this is why I feel like I might be the wrong kind of wife because I'm always in the right mood. I don't think it's ever good <laughs> to be like, what? I'm always in the right mood. I'm always happy. I never think it's good to be silent in front of the children or be in any kind of disagreement. I communicate really well. So we never fight for more than like a couple hours. And if he gets in trouble, that is brilliant. all I do is make him have sex three times a week. I don't know if it is long term. <laughs> I don't know if it is brilliant long term. Well, then, you know what? If you're going to be, I think then, if it's already like in your natural framework in your marriage to like have sex, mm -hmm. like for example, three times a week. It if isn't, you're mad at him. by the way, only if I'm mad at him, yeah. But if you're mad at him, then again, going back to the dominance thing, you could be really, if you want to be really like, like if you want to punish him yeah. you could do things like tease and denial so tease and denial is like it's a form of edging you know what edging yeah. is right so like there's different kinds of tease and denial though where you could maybe create a scenario where he feels like he's gonna have like some you know great romantic sex with you you know you've blindfolded him and then it's kind of like your is that is that does that feel like it's outside of your i'm listening i'm so basically where i'm going with this is like Kind of like using, not letting him have an orgasm, but still experiencing sex with him, but as a yeah. way to kind of punish him, but you're still having sexy time. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like you're edging him, you're like psychologically teasing him, but then he has to like earn the orgasm. That would probably be good. Do you reckon? Yeah, I think Do you get what work. I'm saying though? Because I feel like today I'm taking you from your regular audience and I'm digging <laughs> out your it. comment section of these women who, for lack of a better explanation, I guess they are more like me. You've got Karens. These like 40-year-old <laughs> blonde white women in your mansion. Literally. Being like, I'm in love. And they're doing a lot of the housework and they've had these kids. I feel like that there's a version of you for them. Because yeah. That would be perfect. So we're still connecting. We're still having sex. But yeah. then at the last minute, I am asserting some yeah. female dominance. Yeah. Like he has to beg you to be mm. able to come. Like he has to be like, please, goddess. All <laughs> He's right. going to have to call you. God like you can make up rules. You can, before you have sex, you can be like, right, these are the ground rules. You're going to address me only as goddess. The you trouble is we're <laughs> always joking. So he'd be like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? All right. And then like really experimenting with like holding eye contact for a long time. If he, if he thinks you're joking, you're just going to blankly stare at him. Yeah. Because <laughs> for me, like exactly that. Yeah. Yeah, because I think he's going to be so confused and excited by it because it's not predictable. Because this is something that you're curating from your mind. Mm -hmm. When men get bored is when you become too predictable. But the thing is like, just because you're married to someone doesn't mean that it's a dead end and that's it. You're never going to have excitement. I think it comes from... yeah using what already exists and then making small changes to it that come from you using the same spontaneity that you use to like create humor when you're on stage. Cause like it's similar things that like mm -hmm. are the same faculty in your brain when you're dominating a man. To me, I see it similarly as like, if I'm getting on a stage and I have no script and I have to do a talk for people like this podcast where I'm just entertaining people for an hour and I have to kind of roll things off my mind, but I'm drawing from things that are already natural to me. Right. So because you already have a sense of humor within your marriage, like that's something that I would use as part of my dominance where it's like, oh, you think I'm joking? Like <laughs> <laughs> That is so funny. You think I'm joking? I'm a clown to you? Yeah. Yeah, like, you know, when it's sexy time, he has to call you goddess or like you could even create like, I should do. play where he has to call you goddess in yeah. a very, like, even if it's happening, obviously I'm not saying you have to do it in front of the kids, but if he, if you say something to him, like a trigger word, like, oh, yeah. call me goddess, like he knows it's time or like. Oh, I have a teenager though and she'll listen to your get podcast. It. She'll be like, <laughs> I feel like, <laughs> I feel like I should create like a stereotypical 90s female stand-up character. So, like, I'll get a wig, but it'll be, like, a buzz cut, and she'll wear a blazer and have, like, a big microphone. And I'll get a little foam brick wall, like, to wear as a backpack, so it's behind my head, and that'll be it. 
that would be my dominatrix character. Just a really like unsexy, like manly. You 90s would be surprised. Like in dominance, like I don't even own any latex. Talks about a period. <laughs> yeah, you'd be honestly, you'd be surprised. Like dominance is about just like it's like a higher octave of you that cares way less about it's almost like you know when you're doing your your stand up right and if people don't laugh at something you're not going to crumble and fall apart on no. stage you're just going to move on to the next thing it's like sometimes in dominance like awkward things might happen where it might not land in the way you thought it would land and you move on you yeah. don't you don't fall apart and be like oh i'm never destined to be a dominatrix i can't sure. do it it's too hard it's just like you use humor to move past that and and people think i'm a dominatrix you would not believe because of my job <laughs> really is a female power performance yeah. job. Like, I suppose people get in my DMs about feet. People <laughs> call me goddess in my DMs. They ask if they can send me money. Like, I really am a special type of honey for a bee like that. Like, they find me and they think that this is who I am. And then in my personal life, I'm actually so soft mm -hmm. and like really submissive. Mm -hmm. And I feel like maybe long term in my marriage my husband might be disappointed by that he's like hang on I watched you on Netflix and I really felt like I was buying into this how do you know when a man <laughs> either a man that you're dating or a man you're just getting to know is a right candidate for being dominated I love this question because I love to test it out when I'm talking to men like I might just um put out feelers without being too obvious um and some depending on the man's personality, like if I can already tell that he's he kind of wants to impress me, like let's say he um, orders us a drink and um, the waiter hands him a drink and he hands it to me, I might be like, good boy, pick oh. the right, I like this cocktail, you know, or I might, um, let's say like I catch him, he might notice my toenails are white. And then he might make a comment about it or something like that. Or he might make a comment on my shoes. And I'll be like, oh, you've been looking at my feet, haven't you? Oh, you into feet then? Like just finding ways to kind of drop it in there. Um, also, sometimes I just behave like I'm a dominatrix around men, but it's not about bossing them around and being like, you sit down now. It's more just like the way that I carry myself. I give off this aura that they need to impress me and please me. So I like to use words like I'm disappointed. Or oh. the way that I like to get into her mind is, wow, you didn't strike me as a cowardly type. Oh. But I guess we're all full of surprises, aren't we? You know, men hate being made to feel like they haven't lived up to the expectation that they worked so hard to create. And is a man like that the only man who's going to be giving you gifts, looking after you, spending money on you, the kind of man that you might want to be in a long-term partnership with? I see that happening for myself. And if I don't have that, then I'll, I'm really happy on my own. Mm -hmm. Um... I know it sounds unbelievable for a woman to be happy to be single. I know this is something that you've encountered as well. Yeah. But it's real. Like, it's possible to just be happy being single and to accept that I'm either going to have the man that I know I want to have or I'm going to create the life I want to have for myself. And it doesn't have to be this binary of, like, either or and one is going to be the best one and one's going to be the worst where, you know, being single is seen as a consequence and a circumstance mm -hmm. rather than a choice. And... Even with being with the man that I describe as what I'd ideally want to be with, he's someone I can walk away from. Like you have to have the ability to walk away um, from any kind of man, including the kind of man who you consider your dream man, because that's where your power lies in walking away. And once that man knows that you can walk away from him, he will be humbled. And that's something that a lot of women, they lose their power in relationships when they finally find a guy that they like because they now feel like they have to keep him because oh my god I'll never find this again but that's the scarcity mindset that you've adopted for yourself you can find another man like him if you found him there's five more out there in the world you might not find them all in the same week but they're out there you were able to attract one so you can attract another um I wish we had more time Catherine I think that's a wonderful ending always be prepared even if you're married with three kids <laughs> make sure he knows that you can always walk away and that's why feminism is important, because without financial, political and social equality, well, there are a lot of women who just can't walk away. And those are the women who I really want to connect with mm -hmm. through this podcast. And that's why I'm deeply grateful that you've come on and you've shared your insight. You've shared your journey. You've, you. you've been vulnerable and open. And I deeply appreciate that because I've been able to explore my vulnerabilities with you through this conversation as well. Mm -hmm. And just thank you so much. And thank you for saying yes when I asked you to be on this. I'm obsessed with your podcast. Thank you for saving so many lives. Mm -hmm.